episode 81 of Edward Reeves Buddhist Books Podcast. Episode 80 if you're on the YouTube, because there's an extra episode for the people on the audio-only podcast. This is also episode 20 of the, uh, or rather part 20 of the Tipitaka Recitals. Tipitaka being the earliest, earliest uh, Buddhist text, early Buddhism, pre-sectarian early Buddhism. Um, but they are a part of Mahayana as well as Vajrayana. Um, the emphasis is a, a bit different. I think they could even be considered to be a part of Zen. Uh, but again, the emphasis, emphases, emphases are different um, depending on where you look. So the beginning of the Tipitaka is where we're at. Um, Sangha di Sessa at the beginning of the Vinaya Pitaka, in other words, rules analysis at the beginning of the rules basket. And uh, we have finished with Parajika, which is defeats. That means the four big rules so you can get kicked out of Buddha's order for violating. And we've moved on, moved on from treason to high felonies, basically, which is uh, the, uh, the formal meeting where they get all the monks together and the monk has to admit that he did it. And he's back to step one of whatever achievement. We haven't really gotten into the levels of monkhood yet. Uh, presumably that will come in the second basket. But... Um, yeah, so whatever levels he's attained, he's now considered to be at step one again. Back to neophyte, buddy. Demotion. So uh, so these are big, you know, big rules, but not as big as murder, not as big as having sex, not as big as stealing, and not as big as pretending to be more enlightened than you are. Um, so far, they seem to be the first two of the Sangha di Sessa, which, you know, Sangha means community. Sangha di Sessa, they translate as formal meeting. So community coming together probably is what it, what it means more literally. Um, the, the, the first rule uh, that entails a formal meeting is any form of masturbation uh, if, it, if the act is completed. If the act is not completed, then it's just a regular felony, not a high felony. So it's a grave offense. Um, and uh, the level below that is wrongdoing, which is like a misdemeanor, I guess. We could shift the whole thing and, and start with infraction. Wrongdoing is infraction, and a grave offense is a misdemeanor, and a formal meeting is a felony, and, uh, and a high felony or maybe treason is... Uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If this is your first time seeing me, oh, by the way, yeah, the second, we did the second one last time, and that was rubbing up against people in a sexy way, especially without their permission or with their permission, either one. If you're a monk in the original Buddhist order, you're not supposed to be entertaining these feelings. You're supposed to just kind of meditate through it and come out the other side, not act on it <clears throat> by going up to a person of either gender and uh, rubbing up against them, touching them, playing with their hair, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's that was all an update for the people who have decided to start with this video. That's now you're all caught up, basically, sort of. Um, and now now that I've said all that, if this is your first time seeing me, go ahead and click here instead and start at the beginning of the Tibitaka with the first of the Parajika recitals, and you can work your way up to this part twenty. All right, so those of you who have been following along, last time I mentioned that travels video. If you checked it out, then it will come of no surprise that as a memento of our trip to Kerala, I got this little guy. Okay, well, I'll just uh, keep that over there then. Um, yeah, so the CPI and CPIM are political parties in India. Um, they function as political parties. Basically, when everything's split in the Cold War, there's like the idea of a political party, like the Green Party being the Communist Party that has, you know, some governors are of the Communist Party is kind of outside of the range of the American and probably UK and other Western um, imaginations. <laughs> but that's how it was before McCarthy and all of that. Eh, jumping the gun there, little guy. This is the other one I got. Um, in memento of our trip to Darjeeling and Sikkim, as well as, you know, my trips to uh, Nepal and Bhutan and 
down the street to the refugee colony and uh, having been raised by my father with a Tibetan Buddhist practice, which is really the, uh, you know, I, yeah, it all kind of goes back to that. Um, everything I knew about Tibet up until I was 15, I had learned from my dad. And then after he died, I started having to learn on my own. And someone mentioned this guy called the Dalai Lama. And I was like, the who? So you can imagine it's been a very interesting journey for me uh, for the past 30 years or so, or 28 years after he died, um, learning on my own. And uh, then eventually <clears throat> tracking down the other students of his guru and finding out what it was exactly specifically that he was learning and from who and what that was about and kind of going, hmm. All right, you know, but I was already well on my own path by the time I found that out, and so I just kind of added that as an interesting footnote to my origin story, I guess, um, was his, his teacher and what, what their whole thing was about. I'll go into all that another time. So we'll let this be our special guest for today. And uh, yes, so uh, let's get to the reading, shall we? Probably lost a few people. Um, first, I, I, I probably gained some of the, uh, I gained some people and then I lost some people. Or I lost some people who I would have gained. These two things seem to contradict each other and for good reason. And that's all I have to say about that. <clears throat> we are now going to begin Sangha de Sessa 3. All right. <clears throat> three dots. It starts with three dots. That's fun. At Savati in... Oh, let's, you know, it's... For those who heard me last time, I'm not going to repeat myself, but isn't it a little disrespectful to leave out, at one time, the enlightened one, the Lord, was staying? That's what goes in the three dots. Three dots means... Eh, we've already said this before. Yeah, that's how the chapters start out. It's short, it's respectful, it's important. Can you imagine putting three dots any time that something was repeated in the Bible? I, I want to do that one day, do the Polytech Society version of the Holy Bible, and just three dots in place of, and God spoke and said. Anyway, so at one time, the Lord, the Enlightened One, was staying at Savati in the Jetta Grove in Anattapindika's Park. At that time, the venerable Udayan lived in the jungle. <clears throat> this is sounding familiar so far. This seems to be how the second Sangha Nisesa started out, but we'll keep reading and see where it goes. The venerable one's dwelling was lovely. The venerable one in this case being Udayan. Uh, if you can visualize, uh, what's his name, uh, from Family Guy. Uh, you know, the one... Giggity, that guy. His name is uh, not coming to mind, but you probably know who I'm talking about, right? At that time, right. Okay, so the venerable one, Udayan, his dwelling was lovely, good to look upon, and beautiful. At that time, many women came to the park. Okay, so it's diverging from how the second one began. In order to see the dwelling, then those women approached the venerable Udayan, and having approached him, they said to the venerable Udayan, quote, Honored sir, we want to see the master's dwelling. End quote. Then the venerable Udayan, showing these women his dwelling and pointing out the privies to them, spoke in praise, spoke in blame, and begged, and implored, and asked, and questioned and described, and exhorted, and abused. Let me read that again, because I kind of lost track of what was being said. Let's try that again. Then the venerable Udayan, showing these women his dwelling, and pointing out the privies to them, that means washrooms, right? Spoke in praise, spoke in blame, and begged, and implored, and asked, and questioned, and described, and exhorted, and abused. Udayan did that, talking to these women. All right? Those women who had little fear of blame, who were sly and who had no shame, mocked at the venerable Udayan, called out to him, laughed at him, made fun of him. 
But those women who had shame, upon departing, complained to the monks, saying, quote, Honored sirs, this is not suitable. It is not fitting. We should not wish this spoken about even by our husbands, to say nothing of Master Udayan, end quote. Then those who were modest monks became annoyed, vexed, and angry, and said, quote, How can the venerable Udayin offend women with lewd words? Okay, okay, getting a clearer picture of what Ivy Horner is leaving out, most likely. <clears throat> or maybe the text isn't all that clear about it. So Udayin's being suggestive, abusive, and uh, all these things that it said. All right. <clears throat> then these monks told the matter to the Lord. Then the Lord, on this occasion and in this connection, had the company of monks convened and questioned the venerable Udayan. So what I was saying earlier is these these rules so far seem to all kind of be sub like related to the first big Parajika rule. The first one being no sex. So the first one was no masturbation. The second one was no like rubbing up in a perverted way or touching in a, with perversion in your heart. So this third one is talking. So they all seem so far to be related to that first big rule, these almost as big rules, pretty big rules. All right, the Lord Buddha questioned the venerable Udayin saying, now get ready to write this down and put it in a meme and spread it on the internet. Like all those things that the Buddha says, like, ah, just don't give a shit, right? <laughs> no. <clears throat> okay, he questioned the venerable, sorry, the venerable Udayan, saying, quote, Is it true, as is said, Udayan, that you offended women with lewd words? End quote. It is true, Lord. The enlightened one, the Lord, rebuked him, saying, Quote, it is not suitable, foolish man. It is not proper. It is not becoming. It is not worthy of a recluse. It is out of place. It is not to be done. How can you, foolish man, offend women with lewd words? Foolish man. It is not Dhamma. Uttered in ver is not Dhamma uttered in various ways by me for the sake of passionlessness not for the sake of passion, three dots, similar to the, what he said last time. So I won't copy paste it here like I did uh, in the previous episode. Proclaimed for the allaying of the flames of pleasures of the senses. Is it not foolish man for the benefit of unbelievers? It is not foolish man for the benefit of unbelievers, three dots. And thus, monks, this course of training should be set forth. Whatever monk, affected by desire, with perverted heart, should offend a woman with lewd words, concerned with unchastity, as, for example, a youth to a young woman. It is an offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. End quote. Whatever means he who... In the previous episode, it was there. There's dots here. Monk means, again, three dots. Hopefully you uh, saw the previous episode. Uh, affected by desire means infatuated, full of desire, physically in love with. Perverted means, oh, well, this one's not dots. He, he, this resonated with uh, I.B. Horner, the translator's uh, Victorian British sensibilities, and he thought it bared repeating, so... I'll read it. The perverted heart is impassioned. The perverted heart is corrupt. The perverted heart is erring. And in this meaning, it is understood that the perverted heart is impassioned. There's your meme. Repeating old jokes. Woman means a human woman, not a female yaka, not a female departed one, so not a demon, not a ghost. Uh, not a female animal. She is intelligent, competent to know good and bad speech, what is lewd and what is not lewd. Lewd, 
L-E-W-D, speech means speech connected with privies and with unchastity. What they call here in, uh, in Indian English, um, non-veg, non-veg humor. Should offend means it is called a transgression. As, for example, a youth to a young woman means a lad to a young girl, a boy of tender age to a girl of tender age, a male enjoying sense pleasures to a female enjoying sense pleasures, or not, I would put in, but... Concerned with unchastity means connected with unchaste things. A formal meeting of the order means three dots. See previous episode. Pointing out the two privies, he speaks in praise and he speaks in blame. And he begs and he implores and he asks and he questions and he describes and he exhorts and he abuses. He speaks in praise means... He extols, he praises, he commends three dots, which in this case means Ivy Horner didn't want to write it down because it's not a repeat of anything that was said before. He speaks in blame means he curses, he reviles, he finds fault with three dots. Same. He begs means he says, quote, give to me, you are worthy to give to me, end quote. The privies? Wow, Udayan is into some funky stuff. Anyway, my opinion. You know, teach their own. But if you're a monk in the original Buddhist order, keep your coprophilia to yourself. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, uh, he implores means, he says, quote, when will your mother be reconciled? When will your father be reconciled? When will your devatas be reconciled? When will there be a good opportunity, a good time, a good moment? When shall I have sexual intercourse with you? End quote. Ah, 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 okay, okay. I thought because of the privies he was talking about. Disregard. He's just talking about coming on to them. Not, you know, like, uh, never mind. He asks, means, he says, quote, how do you give to your husband? How do you give to a uh, par, paramour? Whoa, there's a new one for me. Edward, look that up. Paramour. And quote. He questions, means, he says, quote, They say that as you give to your husband, so you give to your paramour. Is that like someone you're cheating on your husband with, maybe? Uh, he describes, means, having asked, he says, quote, Give thus. Giving thus, you will become dear and beloved to your husband. End quote. He exhorts means, not having asked, he says, quote, Give thus. Giving thus will become dear and beloved to your husband. End quote. So if a woman says, uh, Monk, how may I better please my husband in the sack? And the monk says, Oh, give like this. That will please your husband. That's a different issue. But if she didn't ask, that's what Udai is doing. I wish I could remember here. I'll put his picture up. That guy. I want to say Flanders, but I know that's not Flanders. Uh, Gary, Carl, uh, something that means like a big mess. Why am I not remembering his name? Well, anyway. He abuses means. He says, quote, You are without sexual characteristics. You are defective in sex. You are bloodless. Your blood is stagnant. You are always dressed. You are dripping. You are a deformed woman. You are a female eunuch. You are a man-like woman. Your sexuality is indistinct. You are a hermaphrodite. Which, prior to the mid-2000s, would have been considered an insult. Right. So this was 2,600 years ago. So back then that was insulting, presumably, for most people. It was assumed. If it is a woman, if he is infatuated, thinking her to be a woman, and if the monk pointing out the two privies to a woman, maybe privies means something different in Victorian British than it does as wherever privies means washroom. All right. He speaks in praise, speaks in blame, three dots, abuses. It is an offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. 
If there are two women, and he is infatuated, thinking them to be women, and if the monk pointing out the two privies to the women, uh, three dots, it is an offense entailing two formal meetings of the order. If it is a woman and a eunuch, if he is infatuated, thinking them both to be women, and if the monk pointing out the two privies to both, three dots, there is an offense of wrongdoing with an offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. If there is a woman, and he is infatuated, thinking her to be a woman, and if the monk, leaving out, talk on the two privies, talk on is in parentheses, so leaving out the two privies to the woman, leaving out, in parentheses, any part, from below the collarbone to above the knee, speaks in praise and speaks in blame, three dots, and abuses, there is a grave offense. Ah, so if he says, uh, your, your neck is ugly, your forehead is ugly, and your calves, shins, and feet are ugly, then uh, it's a grave offense. But if he says your thighs and your belly button are ugly, then it's a formal meeting, because he's talking about between here and the knees, right? Are we clear? Okay. If there are two women, three dots, there are two grave offenses. Oh, right, okay. So one woman, one grave offense, two women, two grave offenses. If there are a woman and a eunuch, dots, there is an offense of wrongdoing together with a grave offense. Hmm. So, the, yeah, this kind of reasoning doesn't hold up today, at least in half of uh, the, the places that are debating, that are cut down the middle about whether... Uh, people should have certain rights. So he's saying if you're insulting the body of someone who isn't actually a woman, but you think she's a woman, it's not as big of a deal as if you're actually insulting a woman. A little bit turfy, I'm just saying, by our standards. But probably ahead of its time for 2,600 years ago. If there is a woman, and he is infatuated thinking her to be a woman, and if the monk pointing out any part, in parentheses, from below the collarbone to above the knee to the woman, speaks in praise, speaks in blame, three dots, abuses, there is an offense of wrongdoing. Right. Leaving out the privies. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, maybe something in the dots differentiated those two. Once again, that happens. Unfortunately, uh, once we get to the killing, they, they have no problem talking about all kinds of gore. It's the sex that bothers the Victorian sensibilities. If there are two women, two dots, there are two offenses of wrongdoing. For what? I'm not sure. Uh, if there are women at a eunuch, dots, there are two offenses of wrongdoing. Okay. So if he points out the saying, talking about the woman's body in any way, whether it be a compliment or an insult, it's a wrongdoing. Okay, if it's a eunuch, it's a grave offense if it's a woman. Felony misdemeanor. If there is a woman, if he is infatuated, thinking her to be a woman, if the monk, pointing out an article of clothing to the woman, speaks in praise, three dots, there is an offense of wrongdoing. If he's like, that dress girl, you know, then that's a wrongdoing, whether it's in praise or abuse, right? Okay. Um... If there are two women, there are two offenses of wrongdoing. With three dots in between. It's a long paragraph. Um, if there are women at a eunuch, dots, there are two offenses of wrongdoing because you can't go below a wrongdoing. If it's wrong, it's a wrongdoing. It's not half a wrongdoing. That's the slap on the wrist level. I mean, we'll find out later what exactly a wrongdoing entails. You have to, like, sit in the corner and do special things, sweep up after the formal meetings. I don't know. All right, uh, there is no offense if he is aiming at explaining the meaning, if he is aiming at explaining Dhamma, if he is aiming at explaining the teaching, if he is mad, if he is a beginner. So aiming at means explaining, or aiming at parentheses explaining. So if he's, if he's saying, you know, talking about the, uh, the, the, the wheel of 
incarnation, the wheel of samsara, is sort of like the clothes you're wearing. Sure, they're pretty, but also they get dirty. And one day you will be relieved of them and you will be in nirvana. And he's like innocently just trying to draw an allegory. Then someone comes along and says, ah, I saw you were talking about her dress. And it's like, oh, but no, I wasn't like nice dress or ugly dress. Like, right? So it's clarifying the difference. Red, thick and short. Matty, shaggy and long. Sown, I hope the way is at an end. Faith, about a gift, about work. No, I'm not, not glitching. Um, that's uh, one of those titles that's also a table of contents. So that's the list of what we're going to be hearing about next. Okay. At one time, a certain woman, wearing a newly dyed blanket, a certain monk, being infatuated, said to this woman, quote, Sister, is that red thing yours? End quote. She did not understand and said, quote, Yes, master, it is a newly dyed blanket. End quote. He was remorseful and said, What now if I have fallen into an offense entailing a formal meeting of the order? He told this matter to the Lord, who said, Monk, it is not an offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. It is an offense of wrongdoing. Because he pointed out her dress. But he wasn't specifically talking about something above her knees and below her collarbone, and it was about her clothing and not her body. So it was a wrongdoing and not a grave offense, right? It wasn't explicitly sexual, so it wasn't, oh, doesn't entail a formal meaning of the order. All right, okay. Um, yes, at one time a certain woman wearing a rough blanket, three dots, said, so I'm assuming that in the, dot, in the dots are there was a certain monk who said, Sister, is that thick, short hair yours? Well, that could be misinterpreted. And uh, in the way that I'm misinterpreting it, it would entail a formal meeting of the order, but I don't think... Uh, she did not understand and said, yes, matter, it is a rough blanket. No dots, but offensive wrongdoing. End quote, but no opening quote. Horner, getting lazy. At one time, a certain woman was wearing... Horner, I should censor your name, dude. Uh, at one time, a certain woman was wearing a newly woven blanket, three dots, and said, the monk said, Sister, is that your matted hair? She did not understand and said, Yes, matter, master, it is a newly woven blanket. He was remorseful, two dots, end quote, open quote, three dots, offensive wrongdoing. At one time, a certain woman was wearing a rough blanket, three dots, and said, the monk said, Sister, is that stiff hair yours? Yes, master, it is a rough blanket, offensive wrongdoing. At one time, a certain woman was wearing a mantle, and a monk said, Sister, is that long hair yours? Question mark, end quote, one dot, many spaces, open quote, three dots. Offensive wrongdoing, end quote. Speaking of wrongdoings, sorry, I'll keep going. At one time, a certain woman came along having had a field sown. Is that a euphemism? No. A certain monk, being infatuated, said to this woman, quote, Well, sister, has there been some sowing? She did not, she not understanding, said, quote, Yes, master. Only I have not closed the furrow. End quote. He was remorseful. I am confused. Three dots. Monk, there is no offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. There is an offense of wrongdoing. At one time, a certain monk, seeing a female wanderer on the road and being infatuated, said to this female wanderer, I hope, sister, that there is a way at the end. She, not understanding, said, Yes, monk, you will follow it. He was remorseful. Three dots. Three dots. 
grave offense, maybe because he was infatuated or he was implying something, saying something, some euphemism. All right. At one time, a certain monk being infatuated said to a certain woman, quote, you are faithful, sister, but you do not give to us what you give to your husband. End quote. What is that, sir? She said. Sexual intercourse. <laughs> he said. <clears throat> he was remorseful. Three dots, three dots. An offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. At one time, a certain monk, infatuated, said to a certain woman, quote, You are faithful, sister, for you do not give us the highest gift. What is the highest gift, sir? She said. Sexual intercourse, <laughs> he said. He was remorseful, three dots, quote, three dots. An offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. At one time, a certain woman was doing some work. Uh, a certain monk, infatuated, said to this woman, Stand, sister, I will work. End quote, three dots. Quote, Sit, sister, I will work. Three dots. Lie down, sister, I will work. She, not understanding, three dots, quote, three dots, an offense of wrongdoing. Okay. Told is the third offense entailing a formal meeting of the order. Well, there you have it, the third Sangha di Sessa. Maybe next time we'll move on to the subtle forms of thievery. Because uh, if you remember, the Parajikas were sexual intercourse and then thieving and then murder. Hopefully not in order of importance. Uh, and then pretending to be more enlightened than you are. So we've had three Sangha di Sessas, or formal meeting rules, established that are kind of tangentially related to sexual intercourse. I mean, you know, directly, indirectly. And uh, I believe there are 13 in total of these Sangha di Sessa. So you can look forward to that. I'm still trying to remember the name of that character from Family Guy. I'm sure that future me has uh, put it up there. Smart Alec. Because uh, he, of course, looked it up. All right, see? Toy train. Thank you all for joining me on this ongoing journey. This was a particularly short one, wasn't it? Well, shortish. It's on the shorter end of the, the uh, lengths of these episodes. And uh, actually, I, I, I wasn't planning to make one today. I was, uh, I'd made one yesterday, so I was going to take a break today. But then these flags arrived in the, in the mail, and so I, I couldn't resist. See there. Actually, I thought they were going to be the same size. I thought they were both going to be this size, but yeah, it's okay. Too bad the one could be a bit bigger. Uh, that's too much like occupied Tibet, too reminiscent. That's not where I'm going with this. These guys, I mean, they seem to do good work. I mean, I, I'm, I'm smart enough not to get too political publicly since I live here, you know. Uh, but they, they arrange uh, protests and... Uh, try to establish minimum wage where it doesn't exist and you know that kind of thing workers rights farmers rights uh, I think you've probably seen they, they, they and some of the other organizations uh, are responsible for organizing a lot of those uh, large massive protests like I think they had one that was a quarter of a billion people right kind of big um, a strike that kind of thing so they I mean in a way they have their place in the democratic society and the uh, warm tapestry diverse tapestry that is India which is uh, different from the way that I think the western mind usually thinks of communism as being that they take over the government and establish an authoritarian thing and then you know like the Chinese model or the Soviet model 
the North Korean model or, or any of those models. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think they're perfect. I'm not flag, flying it. I wouldn't be able to vote anyway unless uh, I renounced my American citizenship and became a full citizen. But, you know, a small, light, little bit of a fan, I'd say. Um, but, yeah, they're not perfect. I mean, they, they, they like to put all of the communist figureheads of history from all the different regions and periods in history on, uh, on, their, on their banners. And it's like, oh, you can leave off some of those. I mean, you know, Che is a popular one to have, but Mao? Stalin? Kim Jong-un? Really? All of them? You're going to put... Okay. Okay. They were all, you know... Uh, what was it uh, John Lennon said? Um, if you didn't just hear John Lennon's voice, it's because I couldn't find a version of it that uh, YouTube would let me post without blocking it. But anyway, okay, I'm rambling on at this point, so let's go ahead and close, shall we? Any questions? Anybody? Feel free to comment below. Oh, and uh, if you're still with me, yeah, if you, you know, don't mind, you have a moment. You know, Giggity. Um, yes, for those of you listening on the podcast, sorry about that. That was a visual thing and uh, specifically YouTube related. All right, I'll close now. To the north and to the south, to the east, Quagmire! That was his name! <laughs> Why right then? It popped into my head when I relaxed my brain to do... To do a... <laughs> okay, okay, I'll start over. <clears throat> to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below. We send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Until next time.